This is holy ground. And I'd like to thank Chris Kerr and everyone at the Ignatian Solidarity Network for giving me this honor and privilege of speaking to you tonight. I'd like to thank Matt Cupp at the National Advocacy Office of the Jesuit Conference, and of course my colleagues and students at Fordham University. Some of this may sound familiar, <laughs> but it's only because I learned it from you. Uprooting injustice, sowing truth, witnessing transformation, Out of curiosity, please raise your hand if you were born after November 16, 1989. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Tradition means to pass on from generation to generation. And this event is one of the great traditions we have. Thank you for your presence here. And in thinking about the legacy of these Uka martyrs, I could think of no better start than the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. And in that first week, there is the colloquy at the foot of the cross. Ignatius asked the retreatant to, to imagine themselves standing before Christ crucified. And in doing so, to ask the questions that Chris mentioned in his welcome. What have I done for Christ? It's a question of reality. It's a question of honestly and courageously accounting for the present and how we've arrived here. What am I doing for Christ? It's a question of location. Where have you taken your stand? What orients the way you're living, thinking, being, and doing? And what ought I do for Christ? And while all of them in some sense are about action, this one especially is a question of what will you engage in? How will you affect change in yourself and in the world around you? I'd like to reflect then on the UCA's efforts to identify, identify and uproot injustice, thinking about those three questions and about reality, location, and action. We have prayed and we know their names. 1989, nine long years of civil war. Nine long years of suffering, of death. And for the UCA, Nine long years of trying to get each side to negotiate the end of this horrible war. For some of these martyrs, it was happenstance. I remember the story of Martin Meyer, the German Jesuit. He was a scholastic at the time at the Theologate, and that afternoon was having coffee with Elba, with the offensive in the capital, shooting in the very streets of San Salvador, he said, you know, with it so crazy outside, why don't you and Selena stay here at the Theologate tonight? It would be safer. No, no, she said. Obdulio, her husband, we, we've made arrangements at the UCA. We're going to stay with the fathers at the UCA. We'll be safe there. For Father Lolo, founder in El Salvador of Fe y Alegría. For Armando Lopez, who had served so nobly at the UCA in Managua. 
and for Father Moreno, who had directed Diaconia, a wonderful journal. They were part of the leave no witnesses behind. But I'd like to focus especially on these three. Ignacio Eyacuria, the rector, the president of the UCA, a philosopher, theologian, public intellectual. Ignacio Martin Baró, the vice rector, and a social psychologist. And finally, Segundo Montes, the chair of the departments of political science and sociology. And these three were really the targets of this assassination. And so we have to ask ourselves 25 years later, why? Why were these priests targets for murder? And make no mistake, the symbolism, the reason why, was carried out in the very assassinations themselves as their brains were blown out on the lawn of the university. The UCA, like many universities, saw its mission in part as research and teaching, but they also did something they called proyección social, social projection. And what does that mean? We might think it means, well, you take the knowledge inside that you gather and you project it outwards. And there's some of that, but in reality for the UCA, it's the opposite move. It's dedicating itself to a national reality and making it the direction, the focus of study, of research, so that the UCA called itself a university with a center outside itself. It didn't have all of the treasures of knowledge that it gave out very nicely and condescendingly. It looked out at a national reality and said, that's the way the world is, and that's what we need to dedicate ourselves to. We need to learn that reality. And in that reality, to uproot injustice, to sow truth, and to witness transformation. But how? For there were many who were about this task as well. But that the UCA, they saw themselves doing it universitariamente, in the manner of a university. And I think this is the great lesson, or one of the great lessons for us in Jesuit educational institutions. Not to forsake that power of knowledge. to acknowledge that intellectually reality resides in the ones that Ayacuria called the poor majorities. We have to accept the fact that the majority of planet Earth suffers under conditions of poverty, and that's the reality of our world. And theologically, that is where God is present. And so what are some examples of this task of social projection universitariamente? This is a story you've heard many times. Jesuit scholastics in a classroom at the UCA studying philosophy, thinking, what are we doing here? We should be out in the campo. We should be with the people. We should be part of the struggle. What are we doing studying philosophy in a classroom? And Eacuria said to them, we do our work en un escritorio, pero no desde un escritorio. We do our work in a desk, but not from it. We're not located in that desk, but we have a center outside of ourselves. For Ignacio Martín Baró, it was directing the Institute of Public Opinion. They conducted 23 surveys in urban, but especially in rural populations. I mean, they went out into the campo. 
where no one would go to conduct surveys. Surveys on the war, on religion, on opinions, on all sorts of social issues. Why? For Martin Baró, he said it was a social mirror that the people could hold up to themselves and finally see themselves, to hear their truths that no one else would listen to. No media outlet would publish their opinions. The power then of these surveys was to reveal that reality, much like Monsignor Romero's homilies had during his years as Archbishop. For Segundo Montes, it was directing the Institute of Human Rights, of editing scientific journals, journals of theology, and in that Institute of Human Rights to document human rights abuses of massacres, of kidnappings, of tortures. Segundo Montes came to the United States and testified before U.S. Congress. Early on, he saw the problem of the plight of the displaced, of refugees, of what is going on and what will happen to the Salvadoran family when so many are leaving northward. And what does it do to the country, not just financially, the question of remissions, but to the family structure, divided families and children who don't know one parent or both, and that the country feels so painfully today. For Ignacio Iacuria, it was especially in founding the chair of national reality. In a country at war that was so divided, this was a forum, a forum of debate, a forum to get the issues out and to try to get people to talk. And Ayacurio was not scared to talk to anyone. He met with comandantes of the FMLN, and it would be quite a sight to see Ayacurio scolding them that they hadn't read their marks very well. Catholic priests correcting them on their marks. And he would debate Roberto Dovison, the man identified by the UN Truth Commission as a mastermind in the assassination of Monsignor Romero. In that chair of national reality, Ayacurio would call for the Tercera Fuerza, the third force, realizing that during this war, especially by 1989, you had two sides. They were so convinced that the only solution was their side winning the war, that it was that massive majority in the middle that was paying the price. They were the ones who were suffering. And there had to be a way to allow them, to give them space to organize, to create that third force that would stabilize Salvadoran society. So that in a remarkable stretch of 12 years between the Archdiocese of San Salvador under Romero, to the UCA's work during the war, you had efforts to be a voice for the voiceless, but not in a paternalistic way. This was a voice that was working to have voices be heard. Now, there is much more to say, but I'd like to turn uh, to a moment, for a moment, to the theology operative here to the liberation theology at the heart of the UCA's mission. To many today, liberation theology is a bit of a dirty word. And usually it's in these abstract terms or wild caricatures, priests with gun belts or something. This is a concrete liberation theology embodied at the UCA that is a powerful witness to us. And what is liberation theology? Well, I'd like to have us reflect on it in three ways. It's a way of seeking God, a way of understanding one's faith, confronted by the reality of poverty, locating oneself, taking a stand in that reality, and acting in solidarity and commitment to others within that reality. This threefold process then gives us new eyes 
new eyes to see our faith, and new ways to see ideas again. Take, for instance, sin. Rather than simply an abstract offense against God, a legal violation, the reality of El Salvador had the Uca martyrs reflect on sin as poverty. Poverty in all its complexity. Economic poverty. But other kinds of marginalization and exclusion. Race. Gender. Orientation. You name it. The bottom line with poverty is poverty means death. Death before one's time. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a delineation, as John Sobrino would say, between those for whom life tomorrow is a given and those for whom life tomorrow is a question. And when thinking about poverty, one must say that the death of the poor is against. It goes contrary to the will of God. And if that's true, the majority of Earth's population is poor. It is a principal form of sin's domination in the world. What must a Christian do in the face of that sin? We cling to Christ. A Christ who is not only the Christ of the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, but Jesus of the Gospels and his ministry. And what did Jesus do in that ministry? What did he preach but a reign of God that is justice, of welcoming all, no matter what, and asking the important question? For Eacuria was the difference between asking, why did Jesus die, versus why was Jesus killed? Both are important questions. But we can't understand, we can't answer the first one fully, the meaning of Jesus' death, unless we reckon with why he was killed. Similar to the Uca martyrs, we can't understand their legacy without understanding why they were killed. Liturgically, we pray, Agnus Dei, qui tollis peccata mundi, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hey, that's not a one time event, that's a process. And Christians then call to ask themselves, how do I participate in that process? How do I uproot sin in the world so that it can be taken away? And so church, a church that is prophetic, a church that uproots injustice with the Gospels, no, this is not the way it should be. But also, as Ea Curio would say, a utopic one. A one that says yes, that sows the truth of the kingdom of God. God's reign of justice. And that is transforming. That we can be contemplatives in action. That we see the very presence of God in the places in which we are, in the communities that we are a part of. And not that we need to shut ourselves off and then go out and carry something out there. But like social projection, we see the presence of God in all things. In the chapel of the Uca, there's a powerful set of the Stations of the Cross. 
However, instead of the traditional portrayal of Jesus on his way to Calvary, there are pictures of the suffering endured by Salvadorans. And Ayacuría had these images placed on the back wall of the Uca Chapel so that during the Eucharist, the presider, as he lifted up the body and blood of the Lord, he could see that body and blood in the crucified people of El Salvador. And in thinking about the colloquy at the foot of the cross, Ayacuría had this to say. Set your eyes and your hearts upon these peoples who are suffering so much. Some from misery and hunger, others from oppression and repression. And then, before this people thus crucified, to make the colloquy, by asking, what have I done to crucify them? What am I doing in order to uncrucify them? And what ought I do so that this people may be raised? Eacuria once wrote, the spirit breathes in many ways, supreme among them being the disposition to give one's life for others, whether by tireless daily commitment or by the sacrifice of a violent death. This is our challenge. Ricardo Falla, a Jesuit in Guatemala, wrote a beautiful poem after the massacre. And he admitted, he said, you know, Eyacuria, we used to make fun of you. We used to talk about Eyacuria and his air-conditioned office at the UCA. But now, now you've gotten yourself dirty. And noting that Eyacuria and the others had assumed the same position they took when being ordained to the priesthood. Now your face is to the ground in obedience to your heavenly Father. Now you have shown us the power of that knowledge. And this is the legacy of the Uka to us. Their efforts to uproot injustice, to sow truth, and witness to transformation. Witness which is the meaning of martyr. Transformation of ourselves and of our world to more closely resemble God's reign. So please respond. Viva los mártires de la UCA! Viva los mártires de la UCA! Viva los mártires de la UCA! Viva! Thank you.